And yeah, welcome. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and kick it over to Jake, Rashika, and Cole um, to first hear a little bit about how you have structured your your organization and how you arrived to that decision. Um, so we'll just take maybe four or five minutes each if, if you need that, and um, then we'll dive into some questions. I also really encourage people to chime in on the chat. Uh, please share your questions and reactions as they come up. We're a lot of people. This is a seed for further conversation and exploration. So the more that we can orient ourselves to the sorts of questions and reactions people have, uh, the better. Um, as Cole has easily demonstrated. Is that first in, in going or first in going in the chat, Cole? Mostly just a chat, but mostly just to be annoying and, and, and uh, stay in the regular first, yeah. Okay. Thanks well, again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jake, you're closest to my screen on my particular uh, configuration. I wonder if you might introduce yourself. Sure. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I want to make sure that works. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, I'm Jake Shapiro, and I am the CEO of a new company called Radio Public PC, and uh, previously was the founder of PRX, um, uh, which is a long-standing nonprofit uh, public radio distribution company. Um, out of which we also, about five years ago, spun a, another company called Matter Ventures, which is a for-profit accelerator for media startups. So along the way, we've had a variety of opportunities to explore these structures and the uh, hybrid nature of both for-profit and non-profit um, within the context of media and public media and public broadcasting as our industry, as our main focus, and against the backdrop of a uh, you know, huge change in how um, financing, startups, technology platforms, and consumers are um, interacting with all these things. Um, so we had reached a point a couple years ago um, at PRX where um, we've successfully established over you know, a period of 14 years or so um, a, a sustainable nonprofit technology company um, and media company uh, that had started off 100% grant funded and evolved to become um, a lion's share from earned revenue as a distributor as a, a network helping distribute shows like The Moss and This American Life and um, podcasts increasingly from a network that we started called Radiotopia, where the revenue is both from licensing and podcast distribution fees and increasingly sponsorship revenue, as well as crowdfunding. Um, but we'd recognized for a long time that there was a market gap um, and a real need uh, in terms of engagement with the end listeners and, and citizens um, on the platform side. And so uh, when podcasting hit this tipping point of adoption in 2014, we had launched Radiotopia, um, but also decided that we would look at building a platform for consumers to actually manage the listening, the data, the engagement, the crowdfunding opportunity. We were never going to get Apple to really be a supporting partner in that. And we saw that the entire field was still up for grabs and a place where um, a values-driven public media enterprise could actually become the nexus for where this kind of listening happens. But uh, we decided um, that rather than do that internally at PRX, having gone through many versions of uh, product development inside our walls, uh, that the only way to make that a viable um, business and give it a shot at success was to create a separate company. Um, and uh, in thinking about what that separate company should be, realized a couple different things. You know, the strategy was to separate out um, both something that needed a uh, real focus um, that was differentiated from PRX's business. PRX's strategic focus is on the creators, the publishers, the producers. Um, this new company would need to focus much more on listeners, on consumers. It was also a way to mitigate some of the risk because this was going to be a higher risk, uh, you know, startup technology company. And we didn't want to necessarily have PRX and nonprofit and try to onboard all that risk. We wanted to create a company that wasn't competing for the same financing resources. So rather than turning to philanthropy for risk capital that we've done previously for things we built the PRX, the idea was to tap into a different kind of market for financing um, that we still felt was on mission and strategic, um, but wasn't rivalrous with what PRX's funding sources were. And the recent conclusion that that actually should be set up as a public benefit corporation after a lot of diligence on these forms. Um, and so about a year and a half ago, after a bunch of planning, uh, we created that separate company, and then um, very importantly, the only way that that was going to succeed is that we needed to raise outside capital. Um, so the complexity was increased because the 
that had to essentially be like a three-way conversation um, internally at PRX to split out the new company. Um, and then the decision was that I, as CEO of the nonprofit, would actually go with the new company um, and, and become the CEO of the new company. Um, and that we would actually then go out and raise funds directly for the new co with the nonprofit being a founding partner that owned equity, owns equity in the new company. Um, and that has an interlocking governance structure where I remain on the nonprofit board and my successor, who's the CEO of PRX, Kerry Hoffman, joins the Radio Public Board. Um, and then between the two organizations, there's a partnership agreement um, because they have a shared overall vision and mission around helping transform public radio in a digital age with differentiated strategies. The idea was to bind them together in this hybrid structure, but operate completely separately as two different companies. Um, so we learned a lot, and which I can get into later, about both the sort of appetite for understanding of PBC, Public Benefit Corporation, um, in, the, in the investor community, from strategic to mission to institutional to angel investors, um, and uh, a lot about the legal intricacies of like this path from nonprofit to for profit. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, and to cut to the chase, like I'm convinced that it is a, a viable and important and actually like really helpful um, framework and structure that I describe it as both a signal and a safeguard, um, that it becomes an incredibly important sort of brand signifier and alignment around everything from your own staff to your partners to the community at large. Um, but then it actually has teeth that have a safeguard, the Public Benefit Corporation, which I want to make sure we distinguish from uh, B Corps, which is a different thing, um, you know, overlapping, but different to have the accreditation of the B Corp. But a Public Benefit Corporation, we are a Delaware PBC that has in its founding documents, the stated public mission that our, our shareholders and our owners and our governance um, is entitled to consider in addition to maximizing shareholder value. So it actually has um, a critical legal standing at moments of truth in the evolution of the company. Um, we thought that was both a benefit and an, almost a necessity for the nonprofit to help spawn this new company, that it needed to have a mission lock that was not just you know, uh, wishful thinking or marketing language, but was actually you know, full stack authenticity down to its um, definitional state. Um, so I see the question popping up on chat uh, just briefly, the difference between a B Corp and a PDC. So B Corp is a nonprofit that does essentially like a good housekeeping seal of approval. If you meet a certain set of like self-reported criteria about your environmental and social um, sort of operations and standing, um, it's something that's pretty rigorous and it actually has meaning in all kinds of ways, but it's not, an incorporating status. It's, it's essentially a third party that says you are a company that cares about these things. Um, a public benefit corporation, PBC, um, is actually like a C Corp. In fact, it's identical to a C Corp with the important exception that you have, in addition to everything that's sort of, you know, boilerplate C Corp language, you have a stated public mission um, that is co equal with your typical embedded uh, maximizing shareholder purpose for being as a commercial company. Um, and we were watching this trend develop for a long time, but it was when Delaware Supreme Court, you know, embraced that as a um, statute in Delaware, which of course is sort of the ground zero for a company formation in many different industries, but technology in particular, um, that that was a, a very thoughtful application of that rule. And we thought that was a, a time where it might be possible to translate into what we needed to do for both raising money and creating this corporate structure. Um, so I'll pause there because I could go on and I want to make sure we get different angles on this, but as questions come up, I'm happy to explain a little bit more of the, the path that we took to get there and things that we've learned in the in the years since. We did successfully raise two, two rounds of um, funding from a mix of investors for whom my whole case about being a public benefit corporation is that it's a competitive advantage, you know, not hair on the deal and like discounting and, you know, all sorts of confusion. Like I, I have to make that case continuously, but we were able to make that case. Wonderful. Thank you, Jake, um, and welcome. And I see Rashika on my screen, so I'll look over to you. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Brittany, and everyone else? Good. So thank you for organizing this. This is a great topic, and I think um, something we struggle, not struggle with, but we think about all the time. I think uh, for those of us who are trying to build businesses, that are trying to solve social problems, but also um, trying to figure out the right way to do that. The strategic questions are not sort of necessarily philosophical ones. So maybe a little bit of background. Uh, I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called Iora Health. 
uh, the mission, the reason I started uh, doing this, I'm a primary care doc, is really to, I think, restore humanity to healthcare, to create a new model of care that's based on relationships. I spent a lot of my career trying incremental change, taking existing practices and trying to tweak them a bit, and became really clear that what we need to do is just start over and build a new model. Um, you know, I started, I, I was an academic, so I was running a health policy group at Harvard, and so I went to a bunch of health systems uh, in town and asked them, will you let me, within your health system, sort of try and build this new model that started from scratch and uh, focused on relationships and not transactions and stop the billing and all that, and they all told me to essentially pound sand. Right, this was, uh, I think the quote was, our practices are full, we're making money, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And I was like, care sucks, patients hate it, doctors hate it, it's bankrupting the country. But unfortunately, from their point of view, uh, they didn't think there was a problem. By the way, every one of these were theoretically non-profit, right? And I think it was my first, uh, was when I started doing this, I thought uh, very naively non-profit good, for-profit evil, that if you want to solve a social mission, the only way to do it is through a non-profit. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and I went to, and I, what I need to do is actually build something. I need to build a practice where I can demonstrate this stuff and then figure out where to go. And I went to a lot of the nonprofit funders. I went to uh, Robert Johnson and a bunch of the usual nonprofit funders and they want to do this and create a nonprofit to create a new model of care. And they all told me um, really that that's, uh, it's too ambitious. We don't fund operations will fund you to evaluate it. And I said, I don't need to evaluate it. I need to build it. Uh, they were too afraid of failing. Um, they said it was too ambitious. Uh, they all had sort of very short-term thinking. I thought this is going to take me a while to figure it out. And, and really sort of stumbled into, you know, maybe the easier way to do this is due to the for-profit, right? I think having been a little jaded with some of these big nonprofits that were paying their CEOs $13 million a year and flying around in private jets, that maybe tax status and actually mission of nothing to do with each other. So I started a, you know, for-profit, the easiest thing to do at the time was just start an S-Corp, right, because that cost almost nothing to do. I was the sole shareholder, and let's just get on with it. And so we started a practice, and we started building building stuff out, and then um, over time, really bootstrapped for a long time, second mortgages on house, and, you know, doing some moonlighting and some consulting projects and, you know, all sorts of stuff. A loan from a former boss of mine who was wealthy, uh, didn't take any investment money, but just sort of started the company. We never made money, by the way. We kept losing money, um, kept closer and closer to it. And then, you know, eventually after many years, I uh, realized, I, you know, we, we got written, I got written up by Atul Gawande in a great article in The New Yorker that sort of really sort of um, put it on the map and said, you know, I really need to do this to scale it. One thing to build single practices to do this, I want to figure out how to do it to scale, and I need to change the IT platform, and that's going to require some capital. Uh, so I ended up then deciding um, uh, it was time to actually raise some money, and that, as many of you know, required turning into a Delaware C Corp, uh, which is more clumsy and requires a, uh, expensive lawyer stuff, but I think in general, that allows you to take an investment money in a much easier way. So we end up raising some. Uh, uh, investment money from um, first a couple of angels and then a couple of VCs locally. Uh, and then to fast forward six years later, you know, we are now a real company. We have 400 employees. We're $25 million of revenue. We're running 25 practices across the country. We're going to double in size again this year. We've raised $125 million of venture capital money, which is staggering um, uh, at what we've been able to do. Uh, just a couple things. You know, we have maintained a, a really a strong focus on our mission is transform healthcare, right? And uh, and I think the key is what you need to do is just get the right investors on board who believe what you want to believe. And I think what, what I say to every investor is our job is maximize social impact. If we maximize social impact, we will make a ton of money. But the idea goal is not to make money. The goal is maximize social impact and just be smart enough to align that with actually the economic system so then we can take that money and reinvest and keep growing and create more social impact. Uh, it is not easy to find those people. Again, many people I think very narrowly want to maximize short-term profit, but those people are out there. And they're, they're, you find them. Uh, you know, for instance, we, our last round, two rounds ago, was led by uh, a direct investment from an uh, endowment fund, the Rice University Endowment. 
right, who sort of believes that we have, our mission is improving healthcare and education, and we've got this huge endowment, why don't we use some of it to actually improve healthcare and education, not just invest in oil companies, right? So, um, you know, our last round was led by Tomasic, the sovereign wealth fund in Singapore, who believes we're investing the money of the people from Singapore, we want to do generational investing, and let's try and solve real problems, right? So I think it's, uh, it's, it's worked before. We, we have toyed with the idea of becoming a B Corp. And probably two or three times, uh, we've worked with some B Corps. So we've, we've built a practice with the Freelancers Union, Sabino you know, Sarah Horowitz, who I think is an Ashoka fellow or an affiliate. And Sarah, every time I talk to her, why are you becoming a B Corp? And, um, and I look at it, and it, it, and, uh, it looks interesting. I don't disagree with any of it, but to be honest, it, um, uh, it just seems like too much work at the moment, so we just haven't done it yet not because we disagree with any of it. It's not solving a particular problem we have. So we continue to move forward as a C-Corp um, and do the work we have, uh, but I think there are lots of other paths. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Rashika. And and one fellow who, in addition to Sarah Horowitz, who is a B, has a B Corp, corp status um, and it would have energy to help you think or talk through this is Kirsten Toby from Revolution Foods. She was going to join today um, as advertised and um, had to uh, tend to a health uh, need in her family. So um, she did very, like she, she's very um, excited to talk to anybody who, who wants to follow up. And so know that that is an offering coming from her. Uh, and send her your good thoughts. Cole, Gil. Welcome to the digital stage. Yo. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll be, I know that uh, we're kind of almost halfway through our time, so I'll, I'll try to be a bit brief. Um, my name is Cole Gill, as, uh, as Brittany mentioned. I'm the founder and CEO of Labor Voices. Uh, we started, we, we crowdsource data on supply chains uh, from workers in factories. So we're building sort of a a Yelp or a Glassdoor.com for factory workers, uh, particularly in Bangladesh and Turkey and a number of other developing countries. Um, and uh, the the core business that we do is supply chain management, supply chain intelligence. Um, we, you know, we, we have these 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 constituents, which are workers, that are giving us information about their workplaces, or rating their workplaces, and then we're helping those workers find the best place places to work. We're doing that essentially for free in exchange for all that data. And then we take that data and we go to our customers, which are the major multinational brands, you know, your Adidas, Gap, uh, VF Corp, et cetera, and we uh, help them make sure that they're not buying from a sweatshop. So that's sort of the, the core of what we do. I'm happy to talk more about that if, if that's uh, of interest. But um, so I think if, as you've heard from, from, um, from Jake and, and Rishka, uh, I think there's a couple of different uh, reasons why you might consider a, a B Corp. We are not a B Corp, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, one is, uh, as was mentioned, public signaling. So signaling to your funders, to your customers that, hey, we're good guys. You should totally work with us because we're good guys. Um, you may want uh, uh, protection versus investor. So, so for example, if an investor says, hey, wait a minute, you're a for-profit company. I've, I've invested in you and you're not uh, maximizing my shareholder value. You know, what's the deal? Uh, you may want a B Corp to kind of bake in uh, that, uh, those non-financial metrics. Um, and then the third is that you might have some biz business development partnership. So you might be able to either sell to people, sell to other B Corps or buy from other B Corps at sort of, um, you know, in a, in a friendlier relationship because there is sort of now a growing network of uh, either public benefit corporations or certified B Corps uh, to, to do business with. So, so there's some, there's the, the different advantages to that. Um, none of those make sense for us, like zero of them. Um, for us, uh, as uh, Rushka mentioned, uh, it's a, uh, there is a significant amount of time. We've gone through the process of, of doing a lot of the survey and sort of self-assessment that's necessary for, uh, for certification. Um, but then there's a lot more time that's required and expenses required to, to go through the actual legal structure change. We're incorporated as a C-Corp, uh, as a California C-Corp. There are structures in California that, that we could do, but we don't do them. And I'll, uh, in the remaining reasons, we'll, we'll explain why. Um, from my, from my limited diligence, I'm not a lawyer, but from my limited diligence uh, on this, there's no real protection that it affords you versus a, an ordinary investor, um, nor does it, uh, help you versus being a regular C corporation. In other words, 
the case law of uh, investors suing you for not maximizing shareholder value and instead maximizing some other values is really weak. Like that case law is really pathetically weak. So everybody says, oh, I have to maximize shareholder value, but mostly that's just, for my, for my limited diligence, that's, ju that's just a, um, that's a smoke screen. It's a smoke screen for, for saying, I just want to be lazy and I don't really want to, don't really want to deal with uh, non-financial uh, uh, issues uh, because it just, it's a, a you know, public relations issue. And then uh, the fourth is that we don't have any biz dev help. Uh, it doesn't help us sell because our customers are not B Corps uh, or public benefit corporations or anything like that. Our vendors are also not. Um, and there are no, in our space, or no uh, customers or vendors to, to find that, that, where that where such a signaling would help. Um, there's no public signaling for us because we don't have a consumer facing play. Like we're not selling anything to consumers. We have nothing, that, nothing to do with consumers. So there's nothing that the branding would actually help us with particularly. Um, our business model is based on helping workers do their stuff as best they can, helping workers maximize their value. Um, and if we fail at that, then the entire company fails. So the core social mission is baked into the company in a way that, you know, you don't have, for example, with a Tom shoes model. Uh, it's not, you know, we're not sacrificing anything in order to, in order to maximize that. So that particular social impact. Um, and because of that, it's already it's so baked in that you would have to, if you wanted to screw up our social mission, you would have to screw up the company. And, and so it doesn't really make sense for us to worry about, uh, worry about that. So if somebody, if my investors replaced me as CEO, the next woman who, or, or man who came in to be CEO, she would have the same challenges to, to face and she would have to, you know, she would have to keep those workers happy in order to keep getting that data. And then the, the last thing I would say is that we've had significant negative signaling to investors. So when we go out to raise investment, typically, even if I'm talking to a social impact investor, I rip out every mention of impact from my entire deck. I don't tell them anything about it. Unless they are actually a donor, I just go in assuming that any word, any, any hint that I give to them that I care about impact is only going to negatively impact my chances of actually getting investment from them. Um, and so the social impact investors that we have gotten, we've gotten a range of investors, but the social impact investors that we've gotten, um, you know, they're looking for impact on top of any financial returns. And so it's, you know, they can, they can kind of intuit that, yes, there is a social mission here and, 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 and that satisfies that, uh, that, that need for them. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I, 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 well, uh, before I stop there, I'll say the last thing, I, because of some of the programs I've been involved in for impact investing. So, uh, investor circle and, and some others, uh, oftentimes I've been presented with the opportunity of getting a certification, uh, a GEARS certification, that is a sort of certification that, that tells you how, how impactful you are, what, you're, you know, what impact you're actually generating. And I've done that. Uh, and then I often get pitched by B Corp, the certification body, on, becoming, on getting that certification. And part of that certification is saying, as soon as practical, you need to convert your corporate stat structure into being a public benefit corporation. Um, but neither of those are attractive to me and uh, for the reasons that I, that I mentioned earlier. So I've gotten solicited many times and I've thought about it each time, like really carefully, um, you know, well, as carefully as I, as I have time to do. And uh, I've come up on the, the negative answer uh, each time. So if pe when people talk to me about benefit corporations or B Corps, uh, you know, as long as there's no provision in the tax law that gives them tax, you know, tax benefit or any kind of, other tangible benefit, I usually say no, just don't, just avoid it, get, get your business straight, get your, get your uh, financial ducks in a row, investors will be there, and if you need to push back on them for a social mission, you've got the legal standing to do that, you don't really need to, uh, uh, you, don't, you don't need any kind of um, uh, fig leaf uh, to, to, to do that, you can do that yourself, um, but you do need guts, and I don't think that, I don't think having a B Corp status absolves you of, of needing those guts <laughs> to push back against investors. Um, so yeah, so that, that's that's what I say. I'm a, I'm a, a friendly counterpoint to uh, to the B Corp uh, uh, movement. Great. So guts first, structure second. Everyone on this call has guts, so that feels good. Um, Morgan, you asked a question in the chat about um, just like public pushback. Um, that I see. Yeah, I see some questions rolling in in the chat. One around. 
um, public pushback. I don't know if you want to say more to that, Morgan. Um, and then one from Emily. I asked that question before the last two people spoke, and I, I think um, there was some, there was some mention of, of, of that. I don't know. I guess I'm wondering. Um, I'm just wondering if there is an argument, like a PR argument, not to do this, um, where someone has done this and it's gone really wrong. So for us, you know, our organization is is trying to turn around a health crisis, and I just would never want to seem like I'm profiting from that. And I think that there's our brand is just really, really important. And so um, I just wonder, it just seems like a, it would be really risky to become a for-profit or an, even a mixed structure for us uh, and from a PR standpoint. And I just wonder if anybody's had experience with that. Um, so, I mean, I think part of the point here and what Cole I think is really helpful in explaining is that it is highly dependent on the community market partners profile. Um, you know, in our case, as I was starting to lay out, you know, we're in an industry where those kinds of relationships um, were already supportive of this kind of structure, where the market was evolving in that way, and where even down to the individual, like my own um, standing and reputation and history in the field was like critical to making that transition make sense. Um, but I could imagine scenarios where that would be exactly the opposite and where it would seem like it's being, you know, sold out to shareholders or expropriated from the, you know, the value of the nonprofit mission. Um, so it, it, it is highly kind of case dependent. I think that there's a lot of, um, more, uh, embracing and evolution of like in the kind of uh, public's mind about these kinds of models. There's less of a duopoly and sort of nonprofit, for-profit, commercial, non-commercial, Given. Like I think those, um, I think there's a much uh, wider continuum um, and a lot less rigidity around that kind of definitional status as there was uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, so I think that's something that can be overdetermined because a lot of the nonprofits that we've all been part of, in many ways, were either set up at a time where there was a real dichotomy like that, where it was almost in opposition to a commercial activity, or because there was a really clear market failure and like only nonprofits could address that market failure. So I think there's a lot more, um, in a good way, kind of complexity that means that it's still individual sort of choices around this, um, but less of sort of like a, a risk that any one of those moves is by necessity going to have this kind of blowback. Um, I think there, there's a question that Emily asked, maybe I'll just address it quickly around the, the optics of leadership. So yeah, we, we've spent a lot of time making sure, not just on the optics, but the actual legal structure that you know, we had to do a separate third party valuation of the IP and value that was being, you know, um, licensed into the for profit. Um, we have separate committees of each board that oversee the partnership agreement that each of us who are in the overlapping governance role are recused from. Um, the non the for profit does own voting shares of common stock and so represents common, you know, so there's a bunch of those things that were like set up and purposefully to not just address um, optics, but to actually give meaningful ownership and control um, to the nonprofit. Um, and I guess while I have the floor for a second, I'll just talk about some of the points that came up. It's totally true, as Cole said, that there's really thin case uh, histories here that like the public benefit corporations haven't been sued enough uh, for the, anybody to know like how they will fare in moments of truth around, you know, like disastrous outcomes or shareholders revolting or mission organization saying that you went the wrong way. Um, part of what I feel like we've been doing in our version of this in the industry is to be, to, to be in part a laboratory for these models. So part of what I'm hoping that we can be as a sort of a helpful use case is to like, you know, I don't, not that I'm looking to go get sued, um, but like we yeah, are. Somebody here um, on the call can help you out there, Jake. We can just buy. We are. Said, <laughs> yeah, we are at the vanguard. We are the vanguard of some of this and hopefully there are things that we could learn. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the, the theory is that, uh, like in moments of like an acquisition or an exit or hospital takeover or those kinds of things that we would call upon the actual legal piece of this. And we'll see if that actually bears up, um, when that thing happens. Um, but until then, it's been much more of the positioning and the fact that in our industry, you know, half of the top publishers that we work with are nonprofits and public media and then the other half are commercial. And so we're in the right in the right hybrid structure for it. Jake, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you, especially knowing that a lot of the folks joining are also thinking about a hybrid structure. I'm gonna keep you in the hot seat for another minute. Um, one, uh, 
Rashika just asked about um, that does being a B Corp PBC shut the door on going public, um, and then Jill having some questions around pay structure differentiation between the non and for profit. Um, so. Sure. Like talking about it. So in terms of the, like we can totally you know be a public company. In fact, I love the, the that as a outcome. And, um, one of the people who I've read um, that influenced my thinking on this is an investor named Albert Albert Wengner, who's a partner at Union Square Ventures and has been an advocate for the Public Benefit Corporation, in part for helping internet companies that have been staying private for too long because they are resistant to the idea of you know analysts on Wall Street calling their strategic shots. You know, maybe that the public benefit corporation would actually help some more companies become public public benefit corporations. Um, that, of course, would be a really interesting test case. We haven't seen um, very many of them or any of them, um, but that that is a path that we could actually consider. It would be great to be a public media, public benefit, public company um, for, the, for the trifecta. But it, in terms of potential acquisitions, I think it does potentially hinder the same way that it does around um, the litmus test we have for investors who are interested. I mean, it's going to be self. Uh, regulating in a certain way. So any potential acquirer would realize that, you know, there's a potential like that we will resist um, some sort of a merger acquisition that dilutes or gets rid of the mission. And so they would have to understand that what they're buying um, is actually the value that we built because we're a public benefit corporation. If they're just buying us for parts, um, then, you know, they're losing most of the value anyway. So in a way, it's self-reinforcing in our, at least in our industry and our media. In terms of the pay scale, um, for our, in our version of it, since we do have this hybrid, um, you know, we've found that whether we're nonprofit or for profit, we are competing on technology for paying at market rates for software developers anyway. Um, and so, you know, we haven't actually had a meaningful difference, but there is a, a, a benefit to being a public benefit corporation in that we can both um, recruit technologists at, at their market rates and offer them um, equity as part of the package and so that's helped us offset like the early stage capital costs of building the company where a nonprofit hiring software developers is in a tougher and tougher spot these days um, to be able to compete for that kind of talent. Yeah, I think a lot of what um, Jake mentioned also kind of points to some of the core, like the, the core ideas, the core principles around um, around having a for-profit company. Like, why do you have one in the first place? And part of the reason is that you want to, um, you want to access a lot more people uh, that, that are potential investors. Uh, so getting to like Morgan's, uh, Morgan's issue about like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to dilute your brand. Uh, that's, that would be counter to your mission and so on. Um, at the same time, like if you can set something up effectively that can help you access those, those, uh, you know those uh, investors, and then turn their money and, and actually drive a lot of value. Then you can typically you can figure out something on the back end that will that will you know solve that other problem for you. That will make sure that you know sufficient uh, sufficient of the revenue goes back into the social mission or what have you, uh, whether it's a B corporate or not. Um, the other aspect of it is sort of is control. So, so whenever you're taking investment, you do you do think about you're giving up uh, you're giving up a share of the proceeds. You're also giving up a share of the control of the company, and depending on what control you're giving up, that's going to determine how how much capital you can raise. So, if you're investing in Facebook, uh, I think Zuckerberg still has a controlling interest in Facebook. He's got these like giant shares that that vote like a thousand times more than anybody else's shares, <laughs> right? So, you can actually set things up that way where. You know, where someone has a lot of voting power, but they may not have a huge amount of revenue share. They may not have a huge amount of ownership. Um, and you can set, you, basically, there, there's enough flexibility in corporate structures as they are now uh, that, you, that you might not need a, a PBC or, or, or a B Corp to, to, to uh, protect them. That's a, it's Rashiki here. It's a great point. So when we were very careful with most of our investors to get people who, well, they may or may not call them some impact investors, but they, they're doing this not just to maximize profit. They think uh, there's a whole class of people who would like to actually change the world. Um, and it's not a charity, not throwing the money down a hole, uh, but, but they both do it. We occasionally take money from people who don't fit that category. So we, two of our sponsors, our customers, are Humana and United. You know, which are big, bad, for-profit companies, uh, for a bunch of reasons we thought it was important to let them invest. So what we did is we created a whole separate class of stock 
that had no voting rights and no information rights, uh, but allowed them to share in sort of the growth of the company. Uh, and so there's a lot of stuff you can do within a C-Corp structure to actually, as you said, separate out the voting rights from sort of economic share. Uh, and, and again, for me, it's very important to keep the control in a group of people who actually believe the same things I believe, but I'm willing to take money from other people, but just in the structure that they don't have any say. Yeah, to get to Stephen's uh, question, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going to kind of dodge your question a little bit, but it, it, it does occur to me. I don't know if Stephen's still on, actually, but anyway. Oh, yeah, there he is. Um, but uh, it's, it's not clear to me that based on what you, based on what is in this, in this question, whether you actually need a corporate structure or whether you just need a licensing agreement. Um, if, if all you're talking about is different, different folks have different technology that they want to license. Uh, cross license to each other or license to a central entity that that might be sufficient but um, yeah there may be other yeah oh you said investors bringing the capital okay so if you if you're looking for investors yeah sure then, then you're definitely gonna need that you probably will need a, some sort of full fund and it is possible to convert entirely from a for-profit to uh, sorry for entirely from a nonprofit to a for-profit uh, Blue Cross, I think, of California uh, did that. They were bought out by investors, and that spun out the California Foundation, and now they're, they're a for-profit company. Uh, so that, and then angel investors. Um, and it was my goal to have a mix of those people around the table um, who are part owners of the, of the company. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the issue here, it's also, you don't need to do ownership. We have a project we're doing in New York with a group called Grameen America. It's a micro lending company. Uh, what they do is they give micro loans out to largely indigent, undocumented women, and they wanted to build a practice, a primary care practice for these women. Uh, and the way we ended up is they're a nonprofit, and they're able to raise some philanthropy money to get it going. They contract with us, the for profit, as a management contract to run the practice. So some of the staff are actually our staff working with for, for, for profit IORA. Some of the people in the practice are actually working for the nonprofit. For me, and where things get to be a little tricky uh, is actually in the salary and benefit thing, right? Because I think we have different philosophies of compensation, and the nonprofit is trying to keep these rock bottom and really in, in benefit. So really, like their maternity leave was awful. We believe that's the right thing to do to give good maternity leave, and so um, we had to we had to sort of figure that out when people realize they have very different benefit structures, um, uh, partly because of you know, also, and a little bit nonprofit, for profit, a little bit of just compensation philosophy of how things go. Um, so, so I think even even if you have these hybrid practices, those sort of issues will come up anyway. Thanks, Rashika. Um, so we're coming to just a few minutes left, um, and I'm curious to hear from folks. Maybe just doing a quick go round, um, and feel free to to pass if nothing's coming up. But just like or maybe just actually with the time we have from participants who have joined, um, what are you walking away with either something that really resonated or, and maybe more likely given the breadth of this topic, what's a question that you're walking away with that was either raised through, like because of this conversation or one that you are just still um, sitting with? Uh, yeah, would love to hear from folks and then maybe I'll turn it over to our guests to close us. Sasha, I just saw yourself, you take your off of hidden video. Oh, okay, sorry, yes. Um, no, well, well, first of all, thank you everyone. This was really, really useful. I think it's, um, of course, there's a, a, that eternal line about deciding whether for-profit will work for you. And, and we, we went from non-profit to for-profit for many of the reasons that also Cole explained. I would also second many of his observations. We've been looking at B Corp several times we haven't really f seen that it would really move the needle compared to the effort required so i think it's validated a lot of our observations really useful um your strategic insights and considerations also on choosing investors that align um and using that as one of the better reassurances rather than trying to create co complex corporate structures um so we're, we're more, maybe a little more international in profile. Uh, so we've looked at other alternatives. Uh, there's something in the UK called the Golden Share, which was usually done when privatizing public entities. 
Um, it's that there's one share that is loaded with special rights and that is given to a trustee of uh, some special kind. So that might be interesting for some of you to consider because you can really, um, again, I don't know what the precedent in the US would be. I know that in the UK and in most countries, historically there's precedent for that and it was done to make sure something doesn't totally, in particular public asset, doesn't totally go out of control. So, um, so this was really great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sasha. I'd love to hear from a couple more participants about, uh, yeah, what you're walking away with, question or otherwise. Sure, I'll, I'll chip in. Uh, so, so Jake, thanks for your your uh, your confidential answer about kind of who owns what you have, because I've always wondered like how that mix happens. But what I took away from that was that you converted a lifetime time a career's worth of connections and ideas into this entity, and uh, it, it just sort of unearthed sort of the the complexity of, of, the, of, you know, to create a, a benefit corporation that you know, potentially involves a lot of people across the space of all, how you reached out. I'll, I'll just say in, in the civic tech space, uh, there's a lot of global nonprofits that uh, work in their country or work in Europe, uh, but they don't necessarily have much usage in the United States. And so I've been exploring this whole idea of how we might bring some capital in. So thank you. I, I missed, uh, um, not sure who answered my question, but uh, on that, and I'll just want to make one note. So I, I represent um, an investment fund in Australia. Um, it's interested in gov technology, and and they're very conservative. And I haven't even set up a deal, but I've been helping them for a year, sort of scout around. And uh, you know, to me, you know, the uh, trying to figure out how I can craft a pitch to people I actually know is difficult. And so this call has been helpful for me to sort of think about how I could you know, sort of frame some things for folks that actually, you know, do invest in this space. But, you know, I've been very skeptical of open source or nonprofit type models in the mix. Thanks, Steve. Uh, hey, this is Jill. I just wanted to um, chime in. I think where I'm walking away with is a, a greater degree of clarity about how my own control issues are really just at the fore of this. And, um, I, uh, Playworks is a national nonprofit. We're looking at opening a for-profit business that we would own along with some investors that would do uh, playful team building and organizational development work with corporations. Um, and um, I think this has just been really helpful in making it um, very clear to me that one of the important foundational things we need to do is be super uh, clear with both investors, but as well as with our regional offices, um, how this would all work and how the interaction would be when we, how, if, if staff from the nonprofit were involved, how they would be remunerated. Like, I'll just, I just think it's one of those almost like good fences make for good neighbors kind of thing legally and structurally as much as I can in, in advance. So thanks for that. Thanks, Jill. Um, I we're almost at the hour, and Annie, I don't. You, Annie just chatted me something in the Skype that I thought uh, was really relevant, or just like, hey, everyone. Uh, so I've been here transcribing your conversation for y'all to have this uh, abundant hours worth, but it feels like so much more of insights. Um, but we were joking, so the title was Easy as ABC Court, and right? clearly there's nothing easy about it, um, but there's so much wisdom in this room, uh, digital room as Brittany calls it, that uh, we hope this is the beginning of the conversation and you'll kind of pick out who might have uh, more insights on your specific case, um, the joy of fellowship and this network and being able to see on each other. Um, but we're also always looking for more else to put up. So if there's something about the PDC, um, that could be recommended or more in-depth questions. Uh, we're so receptive to hearing about more of these because clearly there's a lot of conversations to be had. Uh, and thank you all for joining. Thanks for transcribing, Annie. Bye. <laughs> Hide it, like hiding right in like just yeah. Uh, but making this conversation accessible for us later. Um, Jake, Rashika, Cole, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, just thank you for, um, I'm happy to follow up if there's additional questions like one-on-one, uh, -on -one, just drop me a note, Steve, sounds like you've got a few too, so 
uh, jake at radiopublic.com is my email. Um, it's definitely not easy path that we took, but uh, learned a lot and are still learning. I'm happy to share it because I think there's more to be um, gained from exploring these models for Shogahala. Thanks. Great. Uh, yeah, keep the questions.